Welcome, Welcome from Alpha, from Alpha to, Omega. to Omega. Hello, and welcome to the 22nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 29th of December, 2012, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. On this Christmas episode, our theoretical physicist guest is Geoffrey West, professor and former president of the Santa Fe Institute. We discuss his recent groundbreaking work in the world of biological and social complexity. In the past few years, the professor has applied his high-energy atom-smashing physics know-how to the field of biology and came up with some startlingly general results which give us deep insights into all sorts of things from the life expectancy of a mouse and the efficiency of cities to the very nature of our social systems and their limits. This week's show is sponsored by Mike W and Paul H. Thanks a million, most gentle of men. If you'd like to give the show a little something for Christmas, why not click on the donate button on the podcast website? If you'd like to get in touch or have any thoughts on the show, why not leave a comment on the episode, join the Facebook group, or send me an email to alpha 2 Omega Podcast, all one word with a number two, at gmail.com. And for all you Twitterers and twits out there, I've just started Twittering too under the name From Alpha to Omega. That's with the number two. We join the interview as the professor discusses how he enjoys living in his own private earthship. Southwest part of the United States, and it's at the base of the Rockies. And ironic, it's that it's, uh, we just had an enormous storm. We had uh, large amount of snow and it got unbelievably cold but i think the temperature out there well in fahrenheit is all i know is about 15. you don't have one of those earth ships in the mountain do you no (laughs) that's more the southern part of the state where the earth ships are kept (laughs) so you worked in the national laboratory in high energy physics for years what sent you off in the direction of biology after all that time So I spent almost my entire career really doing high energy physics, you know, quarks and gluons and dark matter and string theory and so on. And I uh, ran a a significant group at Los Alamos lab. But um, I was involved in the 90s with this this thing called the superconducting supercollider, which was this huge accelerator that uh, had all gone to plan, would have been online now and would have made, you know, the LHC and CERN look like chicken feed. <laughs> Maybe my friends at CERN won't like me saying that, but that would have been sort of the case was the image. Um, anyway, uh, that was canned in the um, Clinton administration. It, it came at a time when there was a lot of ed- rhetoric, you know, the kind of statements that we would hear were, you know, physics was the science of the 19th and 20th centuries. And, you know, biology is the science of the 21st century. And I reacted in a very arrogant and emotional way to that because I would hear it from, you know, in Washington and I'd hear it even locally from our people at the lab. And I reacted by saying, well, you know, if biology is to become a real science, meaning that it's sort of quantitative and predictive, it will have to incorporate not only some of the paradigms of physics, but some of the techniques of physics and so on. And, you know, that's what uh, needs to happen. And so, you know, if nothing else, we need physics to get involved in some of those things. So in reaction to that at a personal level, I started thinking about that a little bit and I got interested in the of aging. I was in my 50s at the time (laughs) and become conscious of the fact that I was, uh, you know, aging, growing old, so to speak. And uh, I became interested in a kind of morbid interest in aging and death. Putting it in terms of science, I translated that into, and, and this was total, out of total ignorance, I mean, total ignorance, I would say this, that if, if biology were a real science, you know, there would not only be a theory of aging and mortality, but more importantly, you would ought to be able to calculate why it is that the lifespan of human beings 
is of the order of 100 years and not a thousand years or a million years or 10 years. You know, where in the hell does this number 100 years come from in terms of the molecular dynamics involved in, you know, the, the molecules of the genes or the molecules of the respiratory complex, which is the uh, little engines that produce our energy and so on. We ought to be able to calculate that number from some fundamental quantities in biology. And so I s kind of stopped thinking about that problem, uh, you know, as a hobby, basically, you know, in the evenings and so on, and when I, you know, was doodling away. And that got me very interested in some fundamental questions in biology because, of course, aging and mortality is a fundamental question. But if you want to understand aging, the process of aging and death, you have to also understand, first of all, what's keeping you alive. And what's keeping you alive is, is metabolism. And I started uh, learning a little bit about metabolism and so on. And then I came across these extraordinary scaling laws that biologists had unearthed over the last, you know, 60, 70 years. And they were amazing. And maybe we can talk about those in a moment. But they were a quantitative statement about physiological properties and life history events, you know, like birth and death and maturity. Uh, they were put, put in a quantitative form and they expressed an extraordinary regularity. And seeing some kind of quantitative regularity is like a, like a bell going off for a physicist. So I started concentrating on those and that got me going on thinking more deeply and more seriously about uh, questions in, in biology. What are the differences between the type of laws you'd like to get in physics and those in biology? Yes, I think that's, that's also a very good question. Because physics, we have this uh, kind of idealized image that there are these universal principles like Newton's laws or quantum mechanics or relativity or thermodynamics and so forth. But certainly Newton's laws, the kind of Newtonian Cartesian image of science, which still persists, and to a large extent has a great deal of validity to it. And that is, there are these laws, these very succinct laws from which everything else, you know, all the phenomena around us could be derived. Not only be derived, you know, in terms of their organization and dynamics, and therefore all kinds of phenomena could be predicted and understood, but they can be done to a large degree in principle to any degree of accuracy. So, you know, the classic example being, you know, the motion of planets around the sun. I mean, all the astronomical data can be calculated to, to great accuracy, even, even to the extent that, you know, the way you and I are now presently communicating via Skype relies on extraordinarily accurate understanding of the motion of those satellites that are going around the planet, transmitting our messages from you to me. You know, that's just one simple example of the kind of paradigm in which physics and, and therefore ultimately technology kind of believes in. So the question then is, you know, could you have that kind of idea, that kind of conceptual framework in biology and then taking one step further into the social sciences and, and, and all of that coming under the umbrella of complexity, complex adaptive systems, systems that have evolved, systems that have enormous numbers of individual components, systems that are, um, you know, are continually changed in response to external changes and so forth. So could you imagine that there could be a set of very simple rules from which all of the phenomena that we see around us, including aging and mortality, but, you know, just the nature of life, the nature of living systems, the nature of disease, the nature of the way we function, the nature of society, could all those be somehow put into a mathematizable framework from which we can calculate things to any any accuracy and the answer to that even in principle is no i think the answer is that we can't have laws that are quite analogous to those in physics we couldn't imagine even in principle i believe having a theoretical framework for aging and mortality that would predict how long you're going to live and how long i'm going to live even in principle that is to do with this extraordinary complexity that's inherent in having 10 to the 14th cells to be in an evolved organism that then has to interact on a continuous basis in our societal framework with all kinds of perturbations and influences 
none of which can be taken into account in making such a calculation. So I think that's, that's an impossibility. So having said all that, <laughs> uh, I now want to say a few words about what might conceivably do be done in terms of you know, a theoretical framework which is still quantitative, mathematizable, and predictive for kinds of phenomena, and the ones indeed that dominate our lives. One that could be is something that physicists often call coarse-grained, meaning that it's not that we can calculate, you know, the lifespan of you and me, but we ought to, be able to calculate what I talked about earlier, the lifespan of the kind of average idealized human being. We ought to be able to calculate why it is that uh, we are destined to live for a hundred years and what are the parameters, and this is a very important point I think, what are the fundamental parameters that are the major determinants of lifespan of a human being to be a hundred years and at the same time why it is that that same tissue, if it's organized as a mouse, only lives for two or three years. We ought to be able to understand that and understand what the fundamental parameters and mechanisms are that are leading to that and use that as a point of departure for understanding what uh, questions of aging and mortality and feed that into structures of the way we deal with biomedicine and so forth. So it's a very, it's a, it's a different, it has some in common with the traditional mathematical physics approach, but it recognizes that it's at this kind of average coarse grain level only that you'll be able to make these kinds of uh, calculations. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I suppose we should describe what the difference is between a complex system and a complicated one. In, in some ways, it, it takes off from what I just talked about, a simple system. But well, a simple system is one for which there are simple equations, or at least uh, highly parsimonious equations that you can write down that encapsulates you know, the entire dynamics, organization, and evolution of that system. Like, for example, pretty much the way we think about the solar system. You know, you write down Newton's laws of gravity, Newton's laws of motion, and basically, you know, well, there's some little small caveats to that, but basically we can determine the motion of satellites and planets to, you know, almost any degree of accuracy. You know, in quantum mechanics, we can calculate the strength of the magnet, the so-called magnetic moment of the electron, to 12 decimal places, to one part in a trillion, which is kind of extraordinary, uh, then that can be calculated, and we can do experiments that verify that prediction. But that embodies simplicity in the sense that, you know, we can encode pretty much everything about the system in some very succinct equations. A complex system is one where we can't do that, you would need, you know, basically a, like a semi-infinite number of equations, if you were to think in those terms, to describe everything in detail. And complex systems usually consist of enormous numbers of actors or agents, like cells in a body or um, people in an economy, interacting across very different scales. So, for example, if you think of biology, it operates on a kind of nano scale inside cells, uh, but it also operates at the ecosystem level, which is, you know, of the order of many, many square miles. All of those have to act in somehow interacting with each other. You know, an ecosystem which may go over, you know, macroscopic scales contains huge numbers of microscopic organisms. For so all of those multiple scales, and that means that there are often unintended consequences when changes take place. And, you know, trying to be predictive about that at a detailed level becomes an impossibility. So that's kind of the fundamental difference, this difference between being able to encode everything in, in a few simple equations versus the impossibility of doing that. The calculation, for example, of the motion of the planets in detail or the motion of satellites that allows you and I to uh, talk right now as a system which we would call simple but the calculation is extraordinarily complicated and um, a fancy watch in the sense that we understand in excruciating detail how a watch works and how it represents time but to you know actually manufacture that watch is very uh, complicated or even you know take something even more so than that like um, you know an airplane where we do understand uh, essentially all of the dynamics, all of the you know, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics and the 
the physics of the materials and so on. You know, you can write a, an algorithm for how to build an airplane, but, you know, it's extremely complicated airplane. So in principle, you know, an intelligent person, but to actually do it is extraordinarily complicated. And in fact, the building of the airplane, not the airplane itself, could be a complex phenomenon because it involves the gathering together in a coherent, integrated way, uh, networks of human beings to make that work. It requires huge aircraft companies organizing the, the, the tools and the people and the distribution networks and so on. So these are complex systems, but the product itself could be simple. Verify, Lieutenant Commander Data. Current assignment, USS Enterprise. Proceed, Commander. Commander, what are you? An android. Which is? Webster's 24th Century Dictionary, 5th edition, defines an android as an automaton made to resemble a human being. An automaton? Made by whom? Sir? Who built you, Commander? Dr. Nunian Soon. And he was? The foremost authority on cybernetics. More basic than that, what was he? Human? Commander, what is the capacity of your memory and how fast can you access information? I have an ultimate storage capacity of 800 quadrillion bits. My total linear computational speed has been rated at 60 trillion operations per second. Your Honor, I offer an evidence prosecution's exhibit A, a rod of par steel, tensile strength 40 kilobars. Commander, would you bend that? Objection. There are many life forms possessed with mega strength. This is not relevant to this hearing. Relevant to this hearing. So what were the major results that you found in your initial work into biological systems? Yeah, so in biology, I think the thing that was so surprising, going back to the story of how I got involved in this, was when I learned about these amazing so-called scaling laws. And scaling laws just means, you know, how does the system change when I change its size? So one of the things that have been discovered a long time ago is the scaling of maybe the most fundamental quantity in, in all of biology, and that is how much energy is required to keep it alive. So that's called the metabolic rate. So it's how many calories do you eat per day to stay alive? And for us, you know, it's roughly 2,000 food calories. And the question is, how does that change as I go across the entire spectrum of organisms? So work that had been done like say 60, 70 years ago, and the name of a man named Max Kleiber is usually associated with it, where he systematically had a bunch of animals, mostly mammals, and discovered that there was an extraordinarily systematic behavior of how the metabolic rate changes as they go across the spectrum of organisms, the spectrum of animals, and he, as a proxy for designating the animals, he just used their weight. So how does the metabolic rate change with weight? And it turns out it's extremely systematic. And just to give you a simple example, if you were to increase the weight of an animal by a factor of 10,000, one followed by four zeros, 10 to the fourth, you would naively expect that the metabolic rate would increase roughly also by 10,000, because you have 10,000 as many cells as you did before. But in fact, what was discovered is instead of needing 10,000 times as much energy, you only need 1,000 times as much. So an extraordinary savings, an extraordinary so-called economy of scale was being expressed. And this goes across the entire spectrum of animals. And this is, in mathematics, this is expressed as something called a power law. And it's a power law with an exponent of three. That's the the example I gave, you increased the weight by four orders of magnitude, but you only need to supply three orders of magnitude, 1,000 times as much energy. So there's this uh, marvelous savings. And that was very systematic across all animals, across all different kinds of taxonomic groups and so on. But what was even more surprising was that if you looked at any physiological variable, like you know heart rates or 
the thing we were talking about earlier, longevity, you know, what, what is the, the height of trees and so on, anything that you could think of that is measurable, all of these had, a, again, like the metabolic rate, a very simple systematic scaling so that you could, in, in, in a sense, predict, you give me the size of an animal, what its metabolic rate would be, what the length of its aorta would be, you know, how long it would live, how many children it would have, and so on, all roughly speaking in this kind of coarse-grained way. This was kind of extraordinary because you know, we believe that every organism, every subcomponent of the organism, every organ, every cell type, every genome has evolved according to natural selection with its own unique history and its own unique environmental niche. And therefore, you would have expected when you looked at these kinds of physiological and life history variables, you would expect kind of some kind of random behavior somehow reflecting rants that we associate with the historic nature of natural selection. And yet all the data seemed to show that it uh, had this extreme regularity. So does this mean that there is something inherent in the structure of <laughs> space and time that leads them to evolve in a certain manner? So what it does mean that, uh, sure, we believe in Darwinian natural selection, but it was operating under certain constraints that are to do with the physical laws that are ne somehow necessarily operating that are driven, in fact, by natural selection, kind of emergent laws that are driven by natural selection, but then constrain natural selection. So you ask yourself, how can it be that, for example, the metabolic rate of mammals, the metabolic rate of fish, insects, and even cells all behave in a scaling way in the same way. What is it that's, you know, if their design, their evolved engineered design is so completely different? I mean, I'm looking out of the window now and I see plants and trees out there, but, you know, they're obviously completely different in their structure than I am. They're static, I move around and so on, so on and so forth. And so what is it that could be operating? What is it that's common? that transcends the design. What I and then my colleagues, I biologists I work with came up with was that the one thing that is universal and is somehow transcends design is that all biology, all biological organisms are sustained by networks. We are, when you think about it, just a bunch of networks. We are respiratory systems and circulatory systems and renal systems and you know, neural systems and so on. And even within our cells, we have networks distributing energy and information and so forth. So there's this uh, host of networks that each organism is involved. And the idea, the, the, the kind of big leap that we made, big assumption that we made, or big hypothesis was that it is the universal mathematics and physics, the geometric properties of these networks that is independent of design and is being manifested in the scaling laws. So that was the idea. So that the mathematics and structure, the network structure of our circuitry system in terms of the mathematics is actually not so different from that of the trees and plants uh, that I see outside. So that was the idea, the, the basic idea. And then it was to, first of all, articulate what are those fundamental properties of networks that transcend design and then put those into mathematics. And just to give you a sense of the kinds of properties that uh, we proposed, they were the following, and they were all thought of, incidentally, as in some ways derivative of natural selection. And they're the following. The first is kind of an problem that the networks kind of have to go everywhere. So, for example, your circulatory system has to have evolved so that the terminal units, the capillaries, end up sufficiently close to cells that all cells are being sustained. So that's called space filling. So the networks kind of have to go everywhere that defines the organism. The second was that the terminal units, like the capillaries I mentioned a moment ago, or the last branch of a tree, things that are the, kind of the endpoints of the networks, are within given design uh, invariant. They don't change. So just to give a, again a simple example, our capillaries are the same basically as those of a shrew, which is, you know, a 
the smallest mammal and sits on the palm of one's hand, um, and the same as those of a whale. That is, you know, if you if you think of, of a, <laughs> whales as a scaled up true, which is what the scaling laws say, it, it wasn't that the everything about the whale scaled up, including the capras. It was that the capras are fixed, are kept fixed, and the rest of the system scales up because natural selection was extremely parsimonious in evolving new species by not having to reinvent the fundamental units each time. It kept the same kinds of cells, the same kinds of capillaries, the same kinds of genomes, and so on, and built on those, and then made small variants in, um, in response to the you know, external environment in which that organism evolved. But the dominant uh, phenomenon was that the structure of the network in terms of the invariance of the unit was kept the same. That's the second. The last one, which is the strongest and biggest assumption, is that of all possible networks that could be space filling and have invariant terminal units, the ones that have actually evolved, the ones that we have, the ones that have evolved by the continuous feedback mechanisms in natural selection are ones that have in some way optimized the system. So going back to our example of the circulatory system, the circulatory system that we have, we meaning all mammals, is one that minimizes the amount of energy that we need to put into the system via the pumping of our heart in order to sustain ourselves, in order to pump blood throughout our circulatory system and supply cells with energy and resources. So we have evolved a system that is approximately optimized so that we can minimize the energy needed to sustain ourselves so that we can maximize the amount of energy we devote to sex and reproduction, which is called um, you know, Darwinian fitness sometimes. That's the idea. And the idea was to put those ideas, these deep kind of assumptions, space filling, invariant terminal units, this kind of minimization of energy or optimization of the, of the system in, in mathematical terms, and what were the fundamental, say, findings or equations that popped out of this basic structure? When you put all this together, all of these scaling laws came out. And what was amazing was that, you know, in particular, the scaling law for metabolic rate, but the scaling law for, you know, maybe 50 different phenomena, physiological properties of different kinds of organisms, but also for these things like, as I call them, life history events, like, you know, the rate at which you grow, how long it takes to mature, uh, how long you live, how many children you have, and so on. All of these things kind of pop out. And they all have the following property. I mentioned earlier in, in mathematical terms that the scaling law for metabolic rate increases as mass to the three quarters power. And that three quarters was less than one which was, in mathematical language, the reason that I said there's an economy of scale. The example I gave, you increase by 10 to the fourth the weight of the organism, but you only have to have 10 cubed, a thousand times as much energy. So it turns out that kind of phenomenon with this quarter power, this one quarter, dominates all of these scaling laws, is, is typical of all of these scaling laws, and it comes out of this theoretical structure on networks. So, for example, just to give another example um, of that scaling law, heart rates decrease in mathematical language as mass to the minus one quarter. The minus means decrease. And what that says is if I increase the weight of the organism of the mammal uh, by a factor of 10 to the fourth, 10,000, heart rate decreases by one order of magnitude by a factor of 10. And that happens systematically, and that's explained by the mathematics that comes out of the calculations from this, this network theory. There's also this invariance in the number of heartbeats that different organisms have. One of the things that is uh, kind of <laughs> intriguing and very whimsical almost is that I just mentioned that heart rate decreases as mass to the one quarter. But it turns out that lifespan, roughly speaking, increases as mass to the plus one quarter. Defining lifespan and getting day lifespan um, is extremely difficult, and there's huge noise in the system, lots of fluctuations around that one quarter power. But anyway, it increases uh, statistically on the average, like uh, approximately one quarter power. Heart rate decreases as one quarter power. If you multiply them together, 
so that the quantity lifespan times heart rate doesn't depend on size. It's the same for all animals. So what is lifespan times heart rate? It's just the number of heartbeats in a lifetime. And so that number, which is approximately one and a half billion, is pretty much the same for all organisms. Just again, a parenthetic remark, naturally evolved man, um, that is until we became kind of socioeconomic creatures and created all this marvelous stuff around us, socioeconomic man lived to about 30 to 40 years. And that fits quite nicely onto this quarter power scaling of lifespan. However, we now violate that. We violate many of these laws now because of our uh, socioeconomic activity. But anyway, so there's this kind of intriguing result that the number of heartbeats, the same across all mammals, the thing that is truly invariant, actually, that is more fundamental, is actually the number of times the reaction takes place in the molecules that produce your energy. And the number of times that reaction takes place in the so-called respiratory complex is roughly speaking the same for all animals that use respiratory uh, metabolism. Have these emergent scalable laws that you've discovered in how life evolves, has it influenced your views on the emergence property of life itself? Well, it has to some extent, in the sense that, you know, it does not you know, this in no way explains anything to do with the origins of life, I would say. The origins of life have to do with biochemistry and, uh, you know, geologic uh, situations and so on. So there's a whole, you know, there's a whole science of that, and that's fascinating and extremely important. But what this does say, I believe, is that it, it's hard to imagine life, this kind of complex, extraordinary complex phenomenon, which has evolved by natural selection, not being based on some kind of network structures. So that at a very early stage in the beginnings of life, when the extraordinary complex chemicals were somehow either uh, serendipitously kind of discovered, if you like in quotes, but just uh, evolved, that important step in the evolvability of life was, in fact, the discovery of networks and the idea that by combining things and working together, you can optimize the system. I think this is an important principle. Um, I don't think biologists like this too much. Let me just say another tangential remark. You know, in physics, all of the wonderful stuff that you hear about, beginning with Newton's laws, all the way up through quantum mechanics and relativity and into string theory and into questions about dark matter and the involvability of the universe and the Big Bang, all of these come from that paradigm. The paradigm that there are, I'll use the word optimization, but it's really minimization principles of some kind. That's the conceptual framework that is used mathematically for deriving the equations that describe all of these you know, wonderful phenomena about uh, the mechanics of life on Earth all the way to the evolution of the universe. And so um, I actually believe that that kind of structure that kind of made a little bit fuzzy, if you like, made fuzzy by the complexity of these phenomena actually is also at work at, at a fundamental level in biology. Are we alone or is there other life in the universe? We believe that life arose spontaneously on the Earth, so it must be possible for life to appear on other suitable planets, of which there seem to be a large number in the galaxy. But we don't know how life first appeared. We had two pieces of observational evidence on the probability of life appearing. The first is that we have fossils of algae from 3.5 billion years ago. The 
Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago, and was probably too hot for about the first half billion years. So life appeared on Earth within half a billion years of it being possible. Which is short compared to the 10 billion year lifetime of a planet of Earth type. This suggests that the probability of life appearing is recently high. On the other hand, we don't seem to have been visited by aliens. So you've also tried to apply these ideas to social networks and to cities. What were your results like? You know, when, when you think back on the biology, it says, you know, the, the salient features are the following. You have these, uh, you know, amazing scaling laws. They manifest an economy of scale. Uh, the bigger you are, the less work, uh, you know, cells have to do as you get bigger. And the other thing I didn't talk about that follows from that, if you feed this network theory, ask how does the system grow, it predicts very beautifully the, what we call the sigmoidal behavior of growth. That is, you grow quickly and then you stop. And it explains very nicely why it is you stop growing and it can derive mathematically the growth curves for any organism. And that's been very successful. So it's very natural to take this kind of paradigm based on networks over into cities and ultimately into companies because you are network situations and you know the question is do they manifest scaling so you know going back to the biology we saw that despite the whale living in the ocean and the elephant with its trunk and the giraffe with its long neck and we walk on two feet and the mouse scurries around we're actually at some kind of 85 percent level scaled versions of each other following these quarter power scaling laws. And the question is, are cities, for example, scaled versions of one another? So let's say you're in London. I better do it in the United States because I'm now more familiar with it. But is, is New York a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up San Francisco, which is the small town I live in here? Well, they have different histories, geography, culture, and so forth. But the only way you can tell it is by looking at the data. So a collaboration with, with colleagues, uh, Rich Betancourt and Jose Lobo in particular, Debbie Stromsky, we started looking at various characteristics of cities, metrics of cities, and asked, do they scale using, for the size of a city, population as the proxy for the size of a city? Again, like in biology, there were these amazing scaling laws, namely that to, you know, kind of the 80, 85 percent level, Cities are indeed scaled versions one another. So, for example, when we looked at things as mundane as gas stations or length of electrical lines and so on, any infrastructural quantity, we discovered that it was just like biology. There was an extraordinary economy of scale, meaning that the bigger the city, the less gas stations it needs, the less electrical lines, the less length of all the roads it needs, etc., all to the same degree. And that saving can be expressed in the following way. If I double the size of a city, instead of needing twice the number of gas stations or twice the length of all the roads, I only need 85% more. And that is systematically, whether you go from a city of 50,000 to 100,000 or 5 million to 10 million, or whether you look in the United States, Latin America, China or Japan or wherever we've looked. So there was, again, this kind of extraordinary generic behavior of infrastructure is looking like biology expressing an economy of scale, not with the same exposure. Biology, the analogous statement was well, double the size of uh, organism. You don't double its metabolic rate. You only need to increase it by 75% approximately. So here it was 85% for cities. So it was a different number, but the phenomenon was the same. But the most interesting thing we discovered was that if you looked at socioeconomic quantities, quantities that have no log in biology, 
and have only evolved on the planet and conceivably only in the universe in the last you know five to ten thousand years the interaction between people and the groups of people that when you look at those quantities you also find the scaling and the kinds of quantities we looked at were things like you know wages things like the number of patents being produced in a city which is kind of a proxy for its innovation looked at uh, disease aids cases flu cases uh, the number of colleges whatever. if you looked at it we found again as in the infrastructure, a systematic scaling, and that that scaling had the same properties, no matter what the metric was we looked at, or no matter where we looked. So again, put that into simple English. Uh, what we discovered was if you double the size of a city, again, from 50,000 to 100,000, from a million to 2 million, or from 10 million to 20 million, what you learned was that you would increase rather than decrease, now it's increase per capita, uh, the, the amount of wages, uh, the number of patents produced, number of AIDS cases, the number of police, the amount of crime, et cetera, et cetera. All of these, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all increased by approximately 15%. So there was this kind of value added every time you doubled the size of a city. And at the same time, when you double the size of the city, as I said a moment ago, you say 15% on infrastructure. So that this gives a kind of a macroscopic view as to why uh, what is driving it to some extent, the growth of cities and why, you know, if, if you put it in simple language, big cities aren't that good at the individual level. At least people perceive them that way. They get, you know, more wages. There's a greater buzz in the city. There's more activity. And, and people are able to ignore the fact that they're also exposed to greater disease and crime. But uh, it's the good thing that they see and attracts them to the city. And uh, at a collective level, we save on infrastructure the bigger the city. What is the effect then of this super exponential growth with respect to the economy and the environment? Well, first, let me say, before answering that, I want to put that into a perspective and ask the question, you know, how could it be that scaling of cities in Japan is the same as it is in the United States as it is, say, in Chile, you know, the, which is what the data shows. I mean, what is it that's the same, even though the systems have not interacted with each other? So what is it that is common across all of them? Well, what is common across all of them is, is people. Cities are people. And I think this is one of the most important points to, to really recognize is the cities are not actually the buildings and the roads and the, all the infrastructure, they really are people. And those buildings and the infrastructure are really manifestations of the interaction among people. And the commonality that we see represented by these scaling laws is a manifestation of the universality of interaction among human beings, the social networks of human beings, the way we interact as human beings, and the way we kind of cluster as human beings, whether it's in families or jobs and so on. And those are kind of, I'll use the word universal, meaning that it, we see that phenomenon across the planet. People are basically the same. Human beings are the same, whether they're in China, Albania, or um, the United Kingdom. And that is being manifested in these scaling laws. And, and so one of the things that was ongoing research is to take the, you know, in, in biology, it was the mathematics and geometry of the network structures of the physiology, if you like, that gave rise to the scaling laws and this kind of commonality stretching across all organisms from cells to ecosystems. In cities, we believe it is social networks and the mathematics of the social networks. And this is what makes it very challenging. And the fact that that is a kind of a virtual social network because it's not a physical network, but that grounded literally on the two-dimensional space that we live in which is our cities and so there's two networks at work here which it makes it more complicated but it's the mathematics of those networks and their integration that is giving rise to these scaling laws and understanding what are the parameters that give rise to this 15 percent is is a critical challenge which we are actively working on now what is the implications of these kind of what we call uh, super linear behavior you get increasing returns to scale the bigger you are. What are the implications of that for growth? And just to repeat what I said earlier about biology, in biology, 
what we discovered was the so-called sublinear behavior, that three quarters power, for example, for metabolic rate, which being less than one, gave rise to sigmoidal growth, growth that increases rapidly, but then stops. And of course, in, in our modern system that we've evolved, especially in, in the last couple of hundred years, the kind of free market uh, capitalist system that we have, we have to have continuous open-ended growth. And that's what we've had in the last couple of hundred years. So how does this fit into this picture? Well, it turns out if you take that super linear scaling of socioeconomic quantities and you feed it into the growth equations, it in fact gives rise to open-ended growth. So it's very satisfying, it's very consistent, the theory. And it, it says that these systems, cities and socioeconomic systems in general, have to be growing at an exponential or faster than an exponential rate. And that's very good, that's good, and that's very satisfying. However, it has, unfortunately, um, a, a kind of fatal flaw in it, if you believe the mathematics. And that is, the mathematics says, that there's something that we technically call a finite time singularity. It says in simple language is that the quantity that you're looking at may be growing faster than exponential, but at some stage in a finite time, it would become infinite, which is impossible. And what it says is that at some stage on that trajectory of growth, you run out of resources, whatever it is that's driving the system. It could be just energy. It could even be ideas. But something which has been driving that system runs out. And the, the theory tells you that what happens is the system stagnates and then collapses. And of course, we want to avoid that. And we have avoided it. That growth, that growth trajectory, that super exponential growth trajectory following from the superlinear scaling is derived within a certain innovative paradigm. That is, you know, it could be that it, uh, you know, coal has been discovered, and that kind of sets the parameters for the way people do business, so to speak. It could be, you know, going back further, you know, iron is discovered, or it could be in more modern times, computers were invented. And what they do is they reset the clock. So that as you're going up this open-ended growth curve, and if you kept going, you would collapse. Somewhere along there, you have to make a major innovation which resets the clock. And that's what we've done. You go along that curve, you reset the clock, and then you start growing again in this open-ended way. You would collapse, but you have to make another innovation and reset the clock. So there's a kind of theorem that you could state, and that is in order to maintain open-ended growth, you have to have continuous cycles of innovation. And that I think is what most people believe and what we have seen and what economists believe and so on. However, going back to the theoretical frame, it has some other fatal flaws. First one is that I said in biology, and I didn't emphasize this enough, that the bigger you are, the sublinear behavior of biology implies that the pace of life decreases with size. So I gave examples of heart rate. Heart rate decreases the bigger you are, the general pace of life decreases, you live long and so on. So everything kind of slows down. Just think, you know, in your head of an elephant, the kind of ponderous behavior of an elephant versus the scarring of a mouse. And that all follows from the network properties. If you then go over to social networks where you have this super linear scaling, it turns out that implies that the pace of life increases with size. So life gets faster all the evidence that we've gathered indicates that uh, life in bigger cities is faster than in smaller cities, even to the extent that walking is faster in larger cities. So going up one of these growth curves means that as you go up, life is getting faster and faster. But then if you want to have continuous open-ended growth, I said earlier that you have to have a major innovation and that you have to have this major innovation in a systematic way. And what that th the theory says is not only as you go up the curve, does life get faster, but you have to innovate faster. So there's kind of a double acceleration going on here. And it's as if the image I like to uh, give of this as a metaphor is that, you know, you're, you're living life on each one of us is living life, so to speak, on an accelerating treadmill. It's getting faster and faster, but that at some stage, you have to jump to another treadmill, otherwise the system would collapse. You have to jump to another treadmill 
which is itself going faster and faster. And you have to make these jumps faster and faster. So, and, and all the evidence seems to point in that direction. If you look at the rate at which innovations have been, have been occurring, they've been occurring at, a, at an accelerating pace. The time to go from you know, computers to IT was maybe 25 years. But, you know, it took thousands of years to go from stone to, to iron, for example. The, the rate at which major innovations, which kind of reset the clock, take place is getting faster and faster. And the big question is, is that sustainable? Is any of that sustainable? Or are we due for a kind of socioeconomic global heart attack? social relations we can look at wealth in some form as maybe a peacocking of social status a way to increase your chances of getting a, an extra mate or two or three or four we also have money in the last few thousand years which is kind of a concentrated form of wealth that allows us to express this social status in nearly an infinite way you know if you were a hunter-gatherer you wouldn't be able to command the wealth of maybe uh, bill gates or warren buffett does this mean that we have really fundamentally to re-engineer things to do with our economic, political and monetary systems to stop us perhaps from not being able to make this jump onto the next treadmill? This is obviously speculation, clearly. But I must say it's hard to, this work, even though it's, you know, it's a, it's a crude, coarse-grained level, nevertheless capturing a lot of the essential features of what's been happening and you extrapolate into the future, this system is not sustainable because you have to make these major innovations faster and faster. And eventually, you know, you could take it reductio ad absurdum. You know, you have every year, you have to make the equivalent to an IT revolution, which is kind of, kind of crazy. So now going to your question, and, and associated with that growth, of course, is I live probably, you know, at a higher lifestyle than the richest people in, in medieval times, right? I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So everything has moved up so that the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffetts and so on are now obscenely rich, so to speak. And that's just part of this continuous super exponential behavior. Now, if we are to avoid what looks like an unsustainable situation, you somehow change the growth the idea of growth, what growth is, what is growth. At the moment, it's defined in terms of purely socioeconomic, well, not socioeconomic, economic terms it's defined as, not socioeconomic. And what we need to do maybe is to change it into socioeconomic terms, and that is define growth in a different way that is to do more with quality of life and so forth. And, and it requires some kind of revolutionary behavior, it seems to me, in terms of what we decide, what it is that, you know, we, each of us as an individual needs. I mean, Bill Gates would be the first to admit he does not need $60 billion. But uh, nevertheless, he has $60 billion. And he gives away, you know, a large amount of money on the scale of you and me. But of course, it's small on the scale of $60 billion. So that he's still within that paradigm that, you know, $60 billion clearly at some level means a lot to him. You know, I'm not being pejorative about Bill Gates. We're all like that. I mean, I have a large house here. I have more cars than I need, et cetera, et cetera. So this needs to change. This dramatically needs to change because it's hard not to see that a lot of this, you know, if you ask yourself, what is the fundamental principle that's driving this? It's hard not to see it at some level as individual greed, that each person wants more. And the problem that we're facing in the world is that, you know, which we haven't talked about, is there are 7 billion people on the planet. And uh, roughly speaking, each, each one of those 7 billion 
you know, in one way or another, wants to live like uh, you and I live in a, in a developed country. And in the next 20 to 30 years, two to three billion more of these people are coming on board. That's very hard to uh, see how that's going to be accommodated without some dramatic revolutionary change. And just to put it into numbers, as biological organs, we evolved with a metabolic rate, with a basal metabolic rate, that is just how much energy do you need to stay alive, um, of about 100 watts. That's all we take to keep alive. That's, uh, you know, we're a light bulb, basically. Um, if you add in all of our activity, the equivalent to hunting and gathering, we as evolved biological organisms before we became socioeconomic required about uh, between two and 300 watts. If you ask today, what a person in the United States requires to stay alive in the style to which he or she has grown accustomed with cars and electricity and, you know, going to the movies and IT equipment and so on. All of that adds up to about 11,000 watts instead of two to 300 watts. You can turn this around and ask yourself, how big an animal are we actually acting as when we're using 11,000 watts? And that is an animal weighing 30,000 kilograms, which is equivalent to about a dozen elephants. It's pretty much the same across the developed world. And as I say, you know, there are some people on the planet, and let's face it, within their different cultural norms, actually all of them would love to be using 11,000 watts. And with two to three billion coming on board quite soon, each one of them wanting two to three billion watts, it's very hard to see how that is sustainable without some extreme extraordinary dramatic change. A previous guest, Professor Gregory Chaitin, a mathematician, has also done some very good new work on the mathematical side of the power of evolution. And he was particularly pleased, he said to me, because he was very surprised to get such great results towards the end of his career. How does it feel yourself to be one of the few scientists to do this? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yes, no, it is interesting. Um... So, you know, I spent most of my career doing, you know, fundamental questions in physics, which are about as distant from this as you can imagine. You know, the quarks and gluons, as I say, and string theory and dark matter. And in the last 15 years, I, in a certain accidental way, migrated into these kinds of questions. And I must say, I feel uh, extraordinarily lucky and fortunate and thrilled that maybe I was primed for it in some way. I don't know. But anyway, got me into this work because it's been extraordinarily rewarding and absolutely fascinating and into all kinds of other deep fundamental questions, which I actually believe are part of you know physics and mathematics. One of my frustrations is that I would like to see more physicists and mathematicians embrace it I'd like to see uh, much more dialogue between physicists, mathematicians, and uh, traditional economists and social sciences. I think there's, um, you know, there has been some in the past, but I think the time now is not only fruitful, but there's a certain urgency because it's clear that, uh, you know, our understanding of economics and uh, social behavior is still very crude. And it's not that physics and mathematics are going to solve the problems. It's simply bringing a new lens to look at some of uh, traditional problems. And maybe out of that, we could forge a bigger picture, deeper view of some of the issues that we're facing. So, you know, like Chaitin, I'm thrilled and delighted and extraordinarily fortunate that it is, uh, you know, that I've wandered into this work. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show today, Professor West. Well, it's a pleasure, Tom. Appreciate it. Before we go, I must say, you've got a great voice. When I hear it, every time I think it's Sean Connery. Oh, my God. I, I must say, I mean, I'm so embarrassed by it when people say it, say things like this. I somehow repress it. In the last 20 years of my life, more and more people have talked to me about my voice. And I feel like maybe I've missed out on something. Well, you still, there's still time yet. You've counted your heartbeats. Right, exactly. Not many. We have all the time. In the world, time enough for life to unfold all the precious things love has in store. We have all On this episode, 
You heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, by Sun Ra and his orchestra, and Commander Data, on trial for his life, in the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Measure of a Man, to the tune of Richie Houghton's The Tunnel, and Julian H. Mulder's Fragments. You also heard Professor Stephen Hawking pondering the evolution of life, accompanied by Sun Ra playing the twin stars of Thens and Electric Six warning us of the dangers of high voltage. You are now listening to a very laid-back Louis Armstrong singing We Have All The Time In The World. Nothing more, nothing less. I'd like to thank Professor West again for his time and effort, especially since he took the time to talk to us while he was still recovering from a bad bout of flu. Many thanks, Professor. And thank you for listening. I hope you join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. Thank you.